the first time we used hydrogen for civil aviation, it all ended rather badly. Since then, whenever you mention hydrogen-powered flight, the first thing many people think of is the Hindenburg. But the times, they are a-changing. And with the pressure to find new non-fossil fuels for aircraft, will hydrogen make a return and become the future fuel for air travel? Now this video is sponsored by Magellan TV. Magellan is a new documentary streaming service run by filmmakers, which is something I can really appreciate because I do the same thing. And I know what it takes to make something that's interesting, engaging, and something which you believe in. Be that about history, science, space, or nature. And that's what I see when I watch documentaries on Magellan. I just wish I had more time to watch some of the 2000 plus that Magellan already have available, and with more being added each week, and a wide selection of those being in 4K for no extra cost, or you can stream them directly to your smartphone or tablet wherever you are. One of the documentaries I could recommend is called Is the Universe Infinite? I love subjects that speculate on the nature of reality, and what we think might be out there far beyond what we can see. And now you can get the same enjoyment I do by going to the link in the description to get your one month free trial of this great new service from Magellan for all documentary fans. Now, whilst the Hindenburg disaster might have set back the use of hydrogen in the mind of the public, after the Soviets exploded their own atomic bomb in 1949, the US Air Force had a new interest in high altitude reconnaissance flights and to avoid enemy fighters and surface to air missiles. This necessitated research into new high energy fuels, and at the top of that list was hydrogen. Up until this point, liquid hydrogen was seen as a difficult to handle laboratory curiosity. But in 1954, the NACA, the predecessor to NASA, were attracted to hydrogen's characteristics as a fuel for high altitude aircraft, with the main feature being that hydrogen has the highest energy to weight ratio of all fuels. Over the following few years, through ground tests, it was found that hydrogen worked well in turbojet engines, and that it could work at altitudes of up to 30,500 meters or 100,000 feet, whereas regular JP4 jet fuel flamed out at around 23,000 meters or 75,000 feet. Thrust was also up to 4% higher, and fuel consumption was 60 to 70% of that of JP4. In 1957, the NACA began Project B, which used a converted B-57 Canberra bomber, not only to test out hydrogen at altitude, but also hydrogen fuel tanks, pumping methods, and handling of hydrogen both on the ground and in the air. For a series of tests up until 1959, it was found that the J-65 jet engine on the Canberra could be transitioned from JP-4 to hydrogen and back again with ease. One thing that was observed was that hydrogen left a dense contrail whereas JP4 left none, which was to be expected as the exhaust from hydrogen would have been almost entirely water vapor. While interest in hydrogen powered aircraft waned, the research data gained found its way into rocket developments, culminating in projects like Apollo and the Space Shuttle, both of which used LOX or liquid hydrogen and oxygen powered fuel rockets. One of the problems that faced the designers of hydrogen-powered aircraft was that although hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, here on Earth it is very rare in its pure form. This is because it is the lightest of all elements and since the formation of the Earth it has long since evaporated away into space. This means that it has to be created by breaking down larger molecules like water and hydrocarbons to release the hydrogen contained within. Whichever way this is done, it is highly energy intensive. The most common method used at the moment is steam reforming. By combining high temperature steam at up to 1000 degrees C with natural gas, normally methane, but also propane, ethanol, and even gasoline to release the hydrogen. This requires energy to heat the steam, but it also produces carbon monoxide as a byproduct, making this type of hydrogen production very fossil fuel dirty. The cleanest way is to use electrolysis. 
This uses electricity to break down water into its component parts of hydrogen and oxygen, but it uses more energy than steam reforming. However, if the electricity is generated by solar, wind, hydro or even nuclear, it is emission and carbon free. The handling of hydrogen is also an issue. To move it around practically for use in aircraft, it needs to be kept as a liquid by cooling it to minus 252 degrees Celsius in thermally insulated cryogenic tanks. At these temperatures, materials become brittle and break easily, and it will leak through the tanks at the rate of around about 1% per day. In its gaseous form at room temperature, hydrogen will diffuse through carbon steel, causing it to become brittle. So much of the existing pipelines and pumping equipment would have to be replaced if hydrogen were to be pumped through them at some point in the future. In Germany though, a dedicated 50 km hydrogen pipeline has been operating at 290 psi for nearly 70 years without any incidents. One of the objections put forward against hydrogen as a fuel was because of its highly flammable nature and it was too dangerous to use. However, in tests carried out when hydrogen was first proposed in the 1950s, tanks of hydrogen and gasoline were deliberately ruptured and then ignited, and it was found that the gasoline fires were much worse than the hydrogen fire, which dispersed rapidly and burned out very quickly. The gasoline fires, on the other hand, stayed close to the source and did much more damage. Hydrogen explosions were also difficult to initiate in air, and could only reliably be set off if the hydrogen was mixed with an equal amount of pure oxygen. And these factors have been borne out in the space industry over the last 50 years. Even though hydrogen contains over three times the amount of energy per kilogram compared to kerosene, because of its low density, it takes up four times the volume, but is much lighter. The fuel tanks on an aircraft would have to be larger and in the fuselage rather than the wings like traditional jet fuel tanks. This would make the airframes larger and less aerodynamically efficient, though the reduction in the weight of the fuel could help compensate for this. However, as we saw in the flying wing video, flying wings have the optimum aerodynamic shape and the volume inside the center of the wing could be large enough for the hydrogen tanks without sacrificing the aerodynamics which is something NASA have been looking into with hydrogen powered fuel cells and electric motors for large aircraft. In the 1980s, the Soviet Union began to utilize the huge natural gas resources it possessed. Tupolev took advantage of this and proposed a hydrogen and later natural gas powered aircraft based on the Tu-154, the Tu-155. In 1988, it started its test flights and was due to come into operation in 1997. It managed around 100 flights before the collapse of the Soviet Union forced the closure of the program. Another issue was that the cost of producing hydrogen was much more than the natural gas it came from, which was another reason why the project came to a close because the oil to make the kerosene was so abundant and cheap. And this is the main reason why we don't have hydrogen powered jets today, even though it was shown to work over 30 years ago. Oil and its infrastructure is everywhere on the planet and comparatively cheap. There are also huge vested interests in maintaining the status quo and keeping kerosene as the main aviation fuel. In a report produced by Airbus in 2003 titled Cryoplane, Liquid Hydrogen Fueled Aircraft, one of the conclusions it drew was that it would take a considerable political change to start the switch from kerosene to hydrogen, and then it would take 15 to 20 years before it could be implemented, providing that the research and development work were to continue at an adequate level. That was nearly 17 years ago, and nothing much has been done for hydrogen production since. It's a bit of a chicken and the egg scenario. Aero and car manufacturers don't mass manufacture hydrogen powered vehicles because of the lack of available fuel. And fuel production isn't increased because there isn't a mass market. But in that time, there have been two things which have changed significantly and now make it more likely. Firstly is the huge increase in renewable power, which is only going to increase. This makes true zero emission hydrogen production possible on a large scale. And second is the public attitude to climate change, 
which is starting to drive government policy and create the considerable political change required to make things happen. So will hydrogen be the future of jet fuel? It makes sense from an ecological point of view, and it would kickstart a whole new sustainable industry. The replacement of kerosene will still take a decade or more for the testing and infrastructure to be put into place, and by that time, large-scale electrically driven aircraft powered by hydrogen fuel cells should start to appear shortly after, providing those with the vested interests can be persuaded or forced into action. What do you think about hydrogen as the jet fuel of the future? Let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe, click the bell notification, and share.